Well, we call it the mother's milk of the wireless industry. Um, just, just the way if you tried to uh, turn on a radio in your car, if you didn't have access to the airwaves, you, we wouldn't be able to receive the music or the news or any station. The same thing, you know, you couldn't send anything over a cell phone or receive anything on a cell phone without using Spectrum. Oh, yes, it's the Qualcomm Podcast. I'm PJ. Thanks for listening. Qualcomm makes some of the best technology on the planet. I'm going to bring you interviews with the experts and the inventors here so you can understand how the technology works and find out what's coming next. Today, we're heading back to school for Spectrum 101 with our very special guests, Dean Brenner and Alice Tornquist. They're Senior Vice President and Vice President of Spectrum Strategy and Technology Policy here at Qualcomm, as well as Danny Tsang from Corporate Technical Marketing. What I want to talk to you guys about is Spectrum. And that's basically, am I, am I wrong to characterize this? But this is, this is invisible. Everything we're going to talk about right now is invisible. Uh, that's right. So, b by the way, PJ, I have yes. to say, so in the history of the world, dating back to the Ice Ages and the dinosaurs, I don't think there's ever been a podcast about Spectrum, so we're <laughs> really looking forward to this. But it's, it, I mean, it's totally important. It's that thing, I mean, people don't realize it, but it's the, the invisible wire that's connecting them to the Internet at all times. Well, we call it the mother's milk of the wireless industry. Um, just, just the way if you tried to uh, turn on a radio in your car, if you didn't have access to the airwaves, you, we wouldn't be able to receive the music or the news or any station. The same thing, you know, you couldn't send anything over a cell phone or receive anything on a cell phone without using spectrum, some part of the spectrum. And for someone who's never heard the word spectrum before, just to clarify, this is, this is not a technology that was quote-unquote, man-made. This is basically a natural resource that we've discovered in the environment. I just think of these invisible tubes going through the air. Is that, is that a, a fair assess, assessment of it? Yeah, you could think of it as a public resource. Congress passed a law in 1934 that basically sets up the way we regulate spectrum in the United States. But So you can think of it as the public's airwaves. It's almost like a public park, um, a public beachfront, but you can't see it, but it's a natural resource that belongs to all of us. Interesting. Do you know what the first use of Spectrum was? Uh, it goes back to actually, even before Congress passed the law in 1934, there was a law passed in 1927 called the Federal Radio Act, which set up something called the Federal Radio Commission, which was a precursor to today's FCC. So certainly it goes back to the the days of the telegraph. That was the original wireless. Wow. So but certainly, and then into radio and TV and, and um, you know, all the media, of medium for any medium of mass communication has at its root some use of spectrum. How many different pieces of spectrum are there and do they do different things? Yeah, many, 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 many different um, parts of the of the spectrum spanning what we call very very low parts of the spectrum to very very high and one of the things we're doing at Qualcomm is we're constantly figuring out how to use different parts of the spectrum that maybe years ago we didn't think were usable for wireless and that's a that's a big driver in 5G some of the millimeter wave spectrum that we really didn't think could be used for wireless and at Qualcomm and working with our partners around the world, we've figured out ways to, to uh, make Spectrum usable that in the past we wouldn't have thought was usable. But there are many, many, you know, zillions of different bands and zillions of different uses. There's a federal spectrum chart which shows just the United States spectrum allocations from the lowest all the way to the highest, and it, it, looks, like a, um, it looks like an eye chart. Okay. Yeah, it's a chart that the Department of Commerce maintains, um, the NTIA, which is a division within the Department of Commerce. You can actually order it off of their website, um, and they keep it updated. Uh, it's very colorful, a lot of magenta, uh, <laughs> but somewhat uh, illegible um, <laughs> if it's a small form. 
right. yeah, I'm looking at it right now. Our, our listeners can go and Google it. Um, it's it's intense, but it's it's pretty cool. I mean, they really they really mapped it out. To your point about you were saying, you know, um, you know, years ago we thought certain uh, certain spectrum was just unusable, but lately we figured out how to use it. Um, spectrum has uh, characteristics. Is that correct? So some spectrum can go longer distances, whereas other might not be able to go longer distances, but it can send information over it faster. Yeah, that, that's basically right, PJ. Uh, but it's just the it that you're talking about is the, a radio signal. So some spectrum, a radio signal can travel relatively far from what, when it, where it's transmitted to where it can be received. And other spectrum, uh, it's this signal cannot transmit nearly as far. It has to be for more short-range transmissions. That's one of the different characteristics um, of spectrum, right? Got it. Mm-hmm. And the, the the spectrum that uh, you were referring to that was challenging was pro- was the spectrum that was is uh, can move very fast, but it has very short range. Is that correct or? Yeah, it's what it's what I call, and everyone in the industry calls, millimeter wave. So the spectrum, the 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 peak of one wave to the next is very close. So the the signal doesn't travel very very far. But the nice part of it is there's a lot of that spectrum. So we can using antennas and this this innovation that we call beam forming, transmit in a very narrow beam. But there's a lot of spectrum, so you can get these very, very high data rates, but over a short distance. Who owns spectrum? You said that the, the, it's, a, it's a natural resource, so governments kind of control it and allocate it. That, that is the case? It, it does differ in different places around the world. But in the United States, everyone, all of us in the public, we all own the spectrum. So when you know Verizon when they quote-unquote buy Spectrum or AT&T or T-Mobile or whoever, they're not actually buying Spectrum. What they're buying is a license to use the Spectrum, and those licenses are handed out by the Federal Communications Commission, an independent agency in the United States government. So we all own the Spectrum, but different Spectrum bands under regulations that the FCC's adopted and legislation that Congress has passed Different spectrum bands are licensed, and there's a whole science for how these licenses are handed out. And the, the company that's using it has a license, but they actually don't own it. I have a question. Um, so I'm hearing a lot about auctions, spectrum auctions that's going on right now. Um, how does that work? So maybe we can go back in time here a little bit. The FCC originally, when they started handing out these licenses, they used to have a trial. Okay, so everyone who wanted to own the cellular system in New York City would file an application, and these applications would be thousands of pages. And then in a hearing room at the FCC, an administrative law judge, so a civil servant, employee of the federal government, conducted a trial, in effect, to decide who, would, who was the best qualified company to, run this, to get the license for the cellular system. We started to do that in the United States when cellular first started, and it turned out that, you know, first of all, it was going to take forever because there was a whole series of appeals after the administrative law judge handed out his decision. You could appeal it to the full FCC. You could appeal that in, in court. It was very arbitrary. How could a judge just, what would the criteria be to decide why one company was better qualified to build and operate a cellular system versus another. And, and these are the so, days of what we would call now 1G or 2G. Is that, is that correct? Correct. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So then um, Congress got together and passed a law, and they allowed the FCC to hand out licenses for cellular and for other things by having a lottery. They invited people to apply and then uh, picked the winning applicant. And, of course, there were, you know, abuses because then, you know, we went from a system where we were requiring all these detailed applications to prove you were qualified to a system where anyone could apply, people who couldn't even, didn't even know what a cellular system was. Right. And and they could get the rights to to build and operate a cellular system. And by that time, cellular was becoming a big thing. There were, you know, companies that were just getting into the cellular business. 
and there were people who would go around to these lottery winners to try to convince them to make settlements and, and uh, enter into uh, let the bigger companies uh, buy them up. So then Congress got together in the, around 1992, 1993. They passed another law that said, we're going to let uh, the FCC hold auctions. And the high bidder in the auction will get the, the right to buy the license to run a wireless network on a, a, in a given location. Gotcha. I would just add one of the key things about the auctions is that they bring in billions and billions of dollars to the federal treasury. So that gives the taxpayers a benefit from the use of these spectrum licenses. And it's been a, been a key driver for getting legislation through Congress. Sometimes the primary motivation to do spectrum legislation in Congress is to count the spectrum auction revenues and, and apply that to something else that Congress wants to do. Exactly. So, so with a lottery, you know, the lottery winner would pay nothing, would get this license for free, you could turn around and make millions and millions of dollars selling it to the company that would really use it, and the federal taxpayers got nothing out of it. So Congress said, you know, that doesn't make any sense. If these things are going to be sold, why don't all the taxpayers get the revenue? Yeah, I mean, it seemed to work out because now we have cellular reception from coast to coast. There's still some places that don't use that system, China most notably, uh, but, you know, a large part of the world now uses this uh, auction system that's uh, worked out very, very well. Very, very well for Qualcomm in particular because, you know, our interest in all of this is we want to see the new technologies get out there absolutely as quickly and as cheaply and as, um, uh, as broadly as possible. In the U.S., how many pieces of spectrum on average does uh, a carrier have? That's a, a interesting question. They would have hundreds and hundreds of different licenses because, um, depending upon the type of spectrum that the, the spectrum band, the bands are licensed either by you know some are done by county, some are done by metropolitan area, some are done by rural area. So you know no one, there's one exception to that there's one piece of spectrum that there's only one nationwide license for and that was a 700 megahertz piece of spectrum that Verizon won so that's they have one license to put um, their uh, LTE on on this one frequency from coast to coast every single day carriers are um, buying and selling and trading licenses back and forth all of those transactions have to get approved by the FCC, and they have a sophisticated um, set of regulations and electronic procedures for doing that. But yeah, the, a, a wireless carrier, a big wireless carrier, has a whole team of people, you know, maybe 20, 30, 40 people who do nothing but keep track of all their licenses. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Correct me if I'm wrong, is, there's a piece of spectrum that uh, is for anyone in the U.S. to make products and to, to, to experiment on. Is that correct? That would be the 5 gigahertz and 2.4 gigahertz? So, um, yeah, so there are many frequencies like that. We call them unlicensed spectrum. Okay. This is spectrum that also, in the old days, people weren't thinking of using it for um, necessarily for wireless, but for things like garage door openers, microwave ovens, um, your personal computer. The way that, that spectrum works is much different. So when Verizon buys a license for a particular spectrum at a particular geographic area, no one else can use the spectrum. They get an exclusive right. That's inherent in, in the license that they would be buying. Mm -hmm. Whereas this other spectrum that we're talking about, anyone can use it, and that means no one has the sole right to use it. It looks more like a public park. I mean, I can go to the park, but so can everyone else on this podcast. And we all have to, no one gets the right to kick anyone else out of the park. We all have to just peacefully coexist. That's how this other spectrum works. Will the carriers um, be using the spectrum that they had before and just uh, using these new uh, cellular technologies over them? Like how is it different from like 4G, for example? Exactly, right. yeah. Well, there are two kinds of spectrum that are going to be in play for 5G, that are going to be key for 5G. One is sub-6 gigahertz, and so that'll be right on top of 
of the gigabit LTE layer, and then the tippy-top layer will be what we call millimeter wave. Whenever we launch a new technology, typically the carriers like to get new spectrum for it because they're already using their existing spectrum for all of their existing customers, right? So if they're going to have a new technology, usually they need new spectrum for that. But then what they do is, over time, they gradually do what we call refarming. So they take the existing spectrum and they eventually transition it over to the new technology that happened in going from 2G to 3G, 3G to 4G, and that is certainly what we expect to happen going from 4G to 5G. This sub-6 gigahertz layer, so this is the for the 5G to get br the broadest coverage possible. So this is the spectrum where the signal is going to travel a uh, relatively far distance away from one uh, one tower to the next or from one cell to the next so that we don't need a zillion towers for this kind of spectrum. And so there are two sources of that spectrum. One is going to be new spectrum that is going to be auctioned by the FCC and auctioned by regulators around the world. And then the second is the folks at Sprint, they have this 2.5 gigahertz spectrum. It's a little bit special because although it's 2.5 gigahertz, so it's a lower form of spectrum, a sub-6 form of spectrum, they have a lot of it. So they're able to run both 4G on part of it and 5G on another part of it. In addition, uh, T-Mobile is talking about launching 5G in the 600 megahertz band. So this is a very, very low spectrum where the signal travels far, but the trade-off will be they don't have very much of it. So that's going to impact their ability to get the, they won't get the fast, super, super, super fast data rates that you could get if you had a lot more spectrum, but they will have very, very good coverage because the signal travels far. Yeah. So this is all, everything that I've just discussed is in this sub six gigahertz layer. And then the tippy top of the, you know, the, the top layer will be a millimeter wave where the spectrum of the radio signal is not going to travel very far, but there's a lot of spectrum, so you get the fastest data rates. This is where you can get, you know, three, four, five gigabits per second mm -hmm. to the wireless connectivity you can only dream about. Today. The, the fiber to the so phone. That's, so that spectrum, actually, the F, in some of it is new spectrum. The FCC will just auction it. But other parts of it, the FCC auctioned years and years ago, and they gave to people before anyone was thinking about 5G. No one thought it could be used for mobile. So it was being used in some cases for a kind of fixed uh, wireless using uh, old technologies that would just go from one tower to another, so kind of what we call point to point. So what the FCC did was they created new rules to allow this spectrum to be used for 5G, and they said, oh, by the way, if you already own it, and you were using it for this fixed stuff, you can now use it for mobile 5G. So the folks at Verizon, and to a lesser extent, the folks at AT&T, they were able to get access to some of this spectrum so they won't have to go through an auction for all of it. But the FCC is kind of, you know, you can think of them like an auctioneer. So they have some of it in their inventory because some of it wasn't being used. So in addition, there'll be some auctions for that spectrum as well. Got it. Hmm. And and to the, the the end user on their phone, I mean, the they'll likely just see that they have 5G service, and in some areas it'll be, a, a, we're, st we're going to be in the mega fast range, and in some areas it's going to be mega mega fast, in some areas it's going to be mega fast. I would assume, just kind of like yeah, the, the way things are now with with 4G LTE. Uh, exactly, and that's right. why one of the things, PJ, is we don't want there to be such a sharp decline, you know, like it used to happen in the 2G days. If you lost the 2G signal, mm -hmm. you were just completely out of luck or you would fall back on something called analog roam right. and mm -hmm. it was just terrible. But that's why what we've done is by making, improving LTE, enhancing LTE 4G so much, we're trying to avoid that kind of situation for 5G. So yeah, for the consumer, you know, you won't know which particular spectrum you're using. It won't matter to you. You're, you'll see an icon on the phone. It'll say 5G. If you, if, you, if you aren't in 5G coverage, the icon will say 4G LTE, and hopefully no matter wh which icon you're using, it'll be, you know, very, very fast. 
Now, you, one of your roles is you go to, uh, I mean, you literally, I mean, it sounds like a movie, but you are you go to Congress and you in, inform them on these technologies. Is that correct? Alice and I do that all the time. What is it like? I mean, uh, do they, the, the, our elected officials, you come in, you sit down and they basically have just tons of questions about how this is going to benefit the public or they are looking for guidance on how um, they could make the system better or what, what, what is it that they, they're, they're usually interested in? The way Congress is set up, there are, you know, there are different committees that have different jurisdiction of all the various parts of the federal government. So in the Senate, the Senate Commerce Committee has jurisdiction over the FCC, meaning they, they are responsible for conducting oversight and writing the laws that govern how the FCC operates. So, for example, earlier when, you know, Dean mentioned the auction, the, the switch to the auction process back in 1993, that would have come up through the Senate Commerce Committee in, in the Senate and the House Energy and Commerce Committee in the House. So those members are pretty knowledgeable and, and focused on this area of spectrum for the most part, you know, more so than members who maybe serve on other committees. So those those are kind of the go-to committees for us in terms of talking to people about spectrum and and what the needs are and they are very interested in it and um, you can see that in the hearing where Dean recently testified that they ask some pretty specific questions and are knowledgeable for the most part they're you know they're elected officials they're representing particular areas that um, you know states that they're from so they they're somewhat focused on how would this benefit my my state. Um, there was a huge focus, for example, in the Senate Commerce Committee hearing on rural broadband because the Senate Commerce Committee is populated by, in some cases, rural members. And its chair, Senator Thune from South Dakota, is obviously from a, you know, very rural part of the country. So there is some sort of um, local focus on that, but they're also interested in the national framework and ensuring that this system of spectrum allocation works well for all U.S. citizens. Yeah, it was actually, it was impressive. Uh, there were, I don't know, there were about 10, 11, 12 senators who asked questions and, um, you know, ranging from people who on the political spectrum would be very liberal to people who are very conservative. Spectrum is not a liberal or conservative <laughs> mm -hmm. concept, really. Right, right. <laughs> really, and so that's one of the major things that we emphasize um, whenever we speak. But it was impressive because they, there were the level of knowledge was pretty high, and the level of questioning it was, um, you know, detailed. And people were very. It's a, a topic that, although it's technical, the politicians are very interested in it. No, I, I absolutely. That's that's pretty wild. Spectrum is the thing that's going to unite the country. Thanks for listening to the Qualcomm Podcast. And if you haven't already subscribed to our podcast, you can do so via SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. Be sure to tune into our next episode when we continue the conversation about Spectrum and the Qualcomm innovations that are helping make 5G happen.